Okay, let's begin with an introduction to eschatology. Uh, I want you to take a moment, talk to the person next to you about this question. When you hear these words, the end times, what immediately comes to mind? It could be words, it could be feelings, it could be pictures, the end times. What comes to mind? Talk to the person next to you about that. So this is just meant to get our, our minds working, right? So tell me, I, wanted, I just want to hear some of what was said. What comes to mind when you hear the words, the end times? Yeah. What's happening now? Good. Yeah. Islamic eschatology, yeah. Yeah, when, when Christ comes in the second coming. Oh, first and second coming. Okay. Yeah, the time between Christ's first coming and second coming. Good. Yeah, second coming of Christ, renewal of everything. Good. Anything else that hasn't been said? Does anyone think, like, helicopters and nuclear bombs and stuff like that? Yeah? yeah. <laughs> You're afraid to say it. You're afraid to say it. But yes, Josh, what I think of is helicopters and nuclear bombs, because we interpret the Bible literally. That's what John saw, right? John saw helicopters and nuclear bombs. Uh, let me ask this. Talk to the person next to you about this. Is, is eschatology practical? So I want you to think of it in, in two ways, okay? Is it practical, like, to my daily life? Like, when I wake up in the morning. Is it practical? That's one. And two, is it practical to the pastor? Is it practical to the pastor? Is it, wait, is it practical to just me when I wake up in the morning? And two, is it practical to the pastor? Talk to the person next to you about that. Okay, is, is eschatology practical? Yeah, AB says yes. I mean, of course the answer is yes, right? Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness, right? All scripture. Even Ezekiel's temple and even the beasts and the, all that great stuff, right? All of it. But how is it, how is it actually practical? So let's start, with, uh, let's start with, like, when you get out of bed in the morning. How is eschatology practical? What does your group say? Yeah. You wake, up, you wake up in the morning, right? Groggy-eyed. Sin comes knocking at the door. Is, es- is eschatology practical then? Or no? Oh, yeah. I, yeah, it has a massive view of cultural engagement. It has a massive implication for cultural engagement, for politics. Absolutely. Um, are we... Uh, oh, I forget who it was. There was a, uh, a famous dispensational preacher who said, who, who compared life, Christian life to polishing the doorknobs on the Titanic. We're polishing the doorknobs on the Titanic. So what he means by that is like, we're, it's all sinking, right? So what we're doing is we're just, we're doing the best we can, uh, but it's all, it's all going down, right? Um, so if, if the ship is going down, how much does this actually matter? Good. Yeah, may, maybe. So then the mission of the church, the mission of the Christian is to save souls, as quickly as possible, because the rapture could be in 30 minutes, right? What, what, are we, what are we wasting our time in class for, right? Jesus could come any moment. And if Jesus could come any moment, then let's get out there and save souls. Good. Yeah, that's exactly right, being faithful. Yeah, being faithful to what he's called you to do right now, which is very different. That's very different than what we just said, isn't it? Like, being faithful to what's ahead of us. I think it was Jonathan Edwards was asked, what would you do? What would you do if you found out that Jesus was coming back tomorrow? What would you do? You know what he did? He took out his calendar, and he looked at the next day's events, and he said, uh, I'll start the morning having breakfast and family worship with my children and wife. I'd then have a visitation to go and see a sick church member. <laughs> and that was what he said he was going to do. He was going to be faithful to what was ahead of him the next day gives us perseverance, and gives us hope. Hope is, without hope, we're purposeless, right? What about for the pastor? What about for the pastor? How is it practical for the pastor? Now, when I think of, this is what I grew up in, okay? When I grew up, and I thought of eschatology in the pastor, what I thought of was someone who was, was scaring people, basically, right? Um, who, who was telling them, you know, at, at any moment, the rapture is going to come. And you're not ready. 
right? You're not ready. You need to be in fear. And if you're not ready for the rapture, so you could either not be ready because you're not living a faithful life, right? And the rapture is going to come and then you're going to go to judgment. Or two, you cannot be ready because you're not a Christian. And here's what's coming after the rapture. What's coming after the rapture is worldwide catastrophe and destruction. Growing up for me, the emotion that came to mind most when I thought of eschatology was fear. You know what it is now? Hope and encouragement. Which, funny enough, is what the Bible says our emotion should be about eschatology. Well, let's keep going. What, what, what is eschatology then? What, what is eschatology? Maybe we're getting a little bit of ahead of ourselves. Let's define eschatology. Uh, well, short, uh, it's the study of the last things. The study of the last things. Literally, entomologically, it's eschatos lagos. Eschatos lagos. The words about the last things, um, the 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 things we could say about the last things. For, for the biblical language for eschatology, uh, I want to do a quick survey of how eschatos is used in the Bible. How is eschatos used in the, in the Bible? Well, one, uh, the last days. The last days. So, so Acts 2.17. Uh, and in the last days it shall be, declares the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. It said it was, it's, it's said to be uh, happening in the last days. Uh, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Understand this, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having the appearance of godliness but not in his power, avoid such people. Why is he telling Timothy to avoid these people because he's in the last days right so this text is how this text is commonly read is that like at the very end of time there's going to be these kinds of people as it it like as if to ignore the fact that these kinds of people have always existed right but paul tells timothy specifically avoid these people because i think i think because paul's aware that timothy's living in the last days Good. Uh, James 5.3, your gold and silver have corroded. Their corrosion will be evident against you and, you, and you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. The condemnation is laying up treasures in the last days. Well, we're at the end of We're at the pinnacle. We're at a turning point in history. Why would you lay up treasures for yourself in the last days? See the urgency that James feels? Contrasting, he probably has Christ's words in mind. Lay up treasures in heaven. Don't do what the Gentiles do. Don't seek after what the Gentiles seek after, right? Instead, make your treasure in heaven. I I think that's what James is alluding to here. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 1 through 3. I am stirring you up, uh, your sincere mind, by way of reminder, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandments of Lord of the Lord, that scoffers will come in the last day, following their own sinful desires. And what's the context of 2 Peter 2? Or 2 Peter 3? What are the scoffers saying? Does anyone know? Christ has delayed his coming. Don't you realize... We were told, we were told already, we were told by Jesus himself in Matthew 24 that in the last days there will be those who say his coming has been delayed. There will be those who say, I am the Christ or the Christ is here. Things like that. And Peter says that, but don't you realize one day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And don't regard the patience of the Lord as him tearing and him being lazy. But Peter, Peter lived in the last days. And Peter's, Peter had a, people who were opposing him saying, look how long it's been since Christ has not come. Since Christ said he would come. How much more so would that happen to us, right? Uh, next, the latter part of the days. Eskatu ton hemeron. The latter part of the days is also used. 
Uh, so example of that, Hebrews 1, 1 through 2. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers. But in these last days, in the latter parts of the days, right? So it's a genitive construction. The, day, the last of the days. Again, we're, we're describing something. We're at the pinnacle. We're at the breaking point. It's like we're at a cliff looking over. We're at the end of the days. The latter part of history. And, and what's the distinction that he makes? What's the difference between the long ago time, right? So that's what he's contrasting. He's contrasting the long ago time to the latter parts of the days. And the contrast is that he's spoken to us by his son. And then he immediately follows that up with an eschatological claim. The son whom he appointed to be the heir of all things. Colossians 1, 15 comes to mind, right? He is the head of all things, the firstborn of the new creation. All things exist in the matrix of Christ, we could say. In Christ. Isn't that a crazy thing to think about? All things exist in Christ. It's not, it's not describing like the material reality, but it is describing a, a significant spiritual reality that everything that exists, exists in only in Christ. In Him and from Him and for Him. Why was the world created? Why did Genesis 1 happen? So that Christ would be the head of all things, right? So in these last days, He's appointed, He's, he's spoken to us through His Son. Through, he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. Next, the latter days, eschate hemere. Again, you can ask questions anytime you want to. Okay? Please, I know we're covering a lot here, and we're going quickly, but please ask questions. The last days, the last day. John 6, 39 through 40. And, it will, and, this will, and this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all he has given to me, but I will raise it up on the last day. And I will raise him up on the last day. So while we have this spectrum of the last days, the latter part of the days, here there seems to emerge a distinction. There's a distinction in the mind of Christ that while there are generally and broadly the last days, the last part of the days, here there's a last day. There's a final day. And in that final day, there's a resurrection that's going to happen. And Christ will lose none of those whom he purchased on the last day. We're, we're trying to discover what eschatology is right now, right? We're talking about what is eschatology. Uh, and we'll get to this soon. But in short, I think eschatology is the coming of God. It's the coming of God. And so, in that sense, the incarnation is an incredibly eschatological event. Think about this. I want you to think about this. What is the bigger discontinuity? Do you know what I mean by that? The bigger discontinuity. So, the bigger departure from the norm. The incarnation or the second coming? Now, I would, I would, when I was first asked that question, I thought the second coming. But I think you're right. I think it's the incarnation. The biggest discontinuity in all of history is the fact that God became man and came to us. So I, I think we can say, in some sense, the Christ event, right, inaugurated the last days. Um, but it seems there's special significance on the resurrection and ascension. But, but, but I would say Christ, and by, by virtue of Christ, his church, inherit the promises of the last days, experience the latter day times. And so because of that, uh, yeah, the, the, we could say the incarnation also. But the kind of the Christ event as a package. Good question. Very good question. John 12, uh, 48, the one who rejects me and does not receive my word has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. On the last day, 
he will be judged. So we have resurrection on the last day. We have judgment on the last day. Next, the last time, eschatos chronos. Eschatos chronos, the last time. Jude 17 and 18. You must remember, beloved, the prediction of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Again, he's reminding, Jude is reminding his audience, right? He's saying that the context is false teachers. So Jude is reminding his followers, we were told there'd be false teachers in the last days, or in the last time. Who's he, who's he probably referencing? What's he probably referencing? Peter? Maybe. Peter says something similar. But I think Peter and Jude are both referring to one specific prophecy. Matthew 24. Look, turn with me to Matthew 24. I mean, he says the, the apostles, but they're getting this. They're getting this from Jesus. Um, Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. Many false prophets will arise and and lead many astray. Then look down later at uh, verse 22. If those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. Then if anyone says to you, he's talking to his audience, right? He's trying to get people in front of him. If anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders so as to lead astray, even if possible, the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. If they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner room, do not believe it. Why should you not believe it? Because, for as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far from the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Right? You don't need to wonder. Like if someone says, hey, everyone, Jesus is in the children's ministry room. Let's go. You don't need to be. You don't need to be deceived like that. You'll know when Christ comes. That's what he's saying. Uh, the last season, eschatos kairos. The last season, First Peter one three through five. I'm excited for Wednesday, James. You, who are being kept by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time or the last season. It's not chronos. It's kairos, right? The last season. Um, again, thinking of history and thinking of time in, in kind of these chunks and segments. And Peter is saying that in the last season, there's going to be a revelation. Again, we're thinking here more of a similar last days kind of event. You, you see these, these words kind of jumble together in some ways. It's kind of a mesh of them. And you see, what's Peter talking about? He's talking about salvation that's going to be revealed in the last season. Is our salvation revealed now? Are we saved now or no? Are we saved now or no? Okay, good. That's a, that's a ba pretty basic question, right? Exactly. It's not. I think you're right. I think in this context we're not saved yet. I think you're exactly right. Peter is talking about a final and ultimate salvation. Right? He's talking about a final and ultimate salvation in which we are delivered. Remember we taught in our biblical theology class, if you can think all the way back, this is why this class is supposed to back in biblical theology. It's so tied to one another. Salvation describes the rescue of God's people from their enemies. So Peter's describing here. Next, eschate hora, the last hour. First John two eighteen. Children, it is the last hour. It is the last hour, and you have heard that antichrist is coming. So now many antichrists have come. Therefore, we know it's the last hour. And how does John define the antichrist? You remember? I think it's in First John four, the one who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh. I think he's, a, he's addressing these heresies of his time, especially docetism, 
We can say Gnosticism might be easier. You guys know what Gnosticism is. That Jesus simply appeared to come in the flesh, but instead uh, he wasn't actually in the flesh. And John is saying that if, if you are part of the church, he, he later, he says in the next verse, they went out from us because they weren't of us. And if they were truly of us, they would have stayed with us. And he says, who is the Antichrist but the one who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh? The last enemy. So we're doing a survey of how eschatos is used. 1 Corinthians 15, 26. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The eschatological enemy, the final climactic enemy, is death. I think it's, a, I think it's time. Yeah, because if you look at the context, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 25. Yeah, so do you see, I think it's t- the picture is temporal. He must reign until he puts all of his enemies under his feet. And then the final enemy, the last enemy, is death. I think that's the picture. So the picture is that there's a progressive reigning and putting enemies under Christ's feet until there's one left, and that's death. I think that's the picture. Because he also uses, in the same context, he uses uh, the last trumpet. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. So he uses eschatos twice in that chapter. First is the last enemy. Second is the last trumpet. I think they're both temporal. Yeah. Does that make sense? So I think if the last enemy is in our future, or if the last trumpet is in our future, then the crushing of the last enemy is in our future as well. Um, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet will sound. I was talking about the final trumpet. We could say that Christ has several enemies on the earth. Um, but at the, at the last day, when the last trumpet sounds, when Christ returns, there's only going to be one enemy left, I think is what 1 Corinthians 15, 26 says. The last Adam, ha eschatos adama, the last Adam, right? It, identifying Christ as an eschatological figure. He's the eschatos Adam. He's the Adam of the eschaton. He's the Adam of the last and final days. That's what Paul is saying, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. The last trumpet, we already said that. So that's some of the, that's the biblical, biblical survey of eschatos in the New Testament. We didn't talk about it in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament. I, th- I think he uses it intentionally as the final Adam, because I think there are many Adam figures in the Bible. Like Noah's an Adam figure, Abraham's an Adam figure, David's an Adam figure, Solomon's an Adam figure. We'll talk about that in, in our, our biblical theology section. But he, I think he's intentional to say the final Adam. Yeah, that, that was every occurrence of eschatos in the New Testament. I think, I think in some senses, we can say, yes, he was being technical. Especially the 1 Corinthians 15, like, he uses eschatos three times there. Um, I think that's pretty significant. The other examples are just last day, last time, right? But this is, like, this is, I think the 1 Corinthians 15 is probably where the question comes into play more. Am I right or no? Because the other ones are, like, the last day is the last day, the last time. Yeah, that one doesn't. Okay. So I would say probably yes, because the context of 1 Corinthians 15 is eschatology, it's resurrection. But two, e- even if he's not, um, I think the Holy Spirit can inspire that kind of use. So that I think of Jesus when he says to the Sadducees, God said, I am the, fa- the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, he's not, but he's the God of the living. So Jesus proved resurrection in the Old Testament with the tense of a verb. Um, and I think we can we can use that kind of reading as well. Um, even in ways that Moses probably didn't intend that. But that's okay. Because God did. Yeah. Good question. Uh, divisions in eschatology. So there's, there's, there's two kinds of eschatology. Okay? We're going to focus mostly on the first in this class. We'll focus a little bit on the second, but mostly on the first. And that's cosmic eschatology. Because of cosmic eschatology, I'll get to the question in a second. It, it refers primarily to God's plan for heaven and earth, right? So when we think of eschatology, a lot of times we think about questions like the rapture, heaven and hell, the intermediate state, that kind of stuff, right? That's not what cosmic eschatology is. Cosmic eschatology instead is God's actual plan for his world, his creation. So Gerhard Voss says this, eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. It deals with the teaching or belief that the world movement, do you see that? The world movement 
religiously considered, tends towards a definite final goal, beyond which a new order of affairs will be established. Right? So history is moving in a direction. It's moving towards a goal. It's moving towards a telos, to use your Greek word from your quiz today, frequently with further implication. This new order of affairs will not be subject to any further change, but will partake of the static character of the eternal. Every word in Gerhardus Voss is intentional. I love him. See, what, what's he saying there? The, the, we're moving in a direction towards a final state in which we call it the final state because there will be no more changes once we enter into it. So eschatology, cosmic eschatology, then, is that trajectory. What, what are we, how, where are we moving towards and how are we getting there? Uh, then secondly, though, is, co- um, is personal eschatology. Personal eschatology. And that's what we think of normally when we think of eschatology, right? So that has more to deal with um, the individual soul, the resurrection of people, things like that. Now, we're not supposed to separate these harshly, though. Remember what Paul says in Ephesians 1, 9, and 10? Hopefully you do. We spend so much time studying that. We're studying it now. Paul says that our redemption revealed a mystery. Turn, turn, turn there with me to Ephesians 1, 9 through 10. So while we have these divisions in eschatology, and we need to keep them separate. If we don't keep them separate, we're going to be confused when we get to certain texts. But when we were redeemed, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fulfillment of the time, to unite all things in him, the things in heaven, the things on earth. So our redemption, right, redemption is what? Personal eschatology. Our personal eschatology revealed something about cosmic eschatology, right? God's plan for me revealed God's plan for the cosmos, which is where he goes next. In verse 11, In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him that works all things according to the purpose of his will. He predestines all things that happen according to the purpose of his will. And what, remember his will, verse 9, what is his will? His will is to make Christ the Lord of all things, to unite all things in Christ. He's predestined that outcome, and he's predestined the events that lead to that outcome, that's cosmic eschatology, right? But he was predestined earlier in verse four and, or verse 5, he predestined us for adoption. Personal eschatology. We will be adopted. Or we have been adopted, we will be adopted on the last day. So, so while, while we might keep these two separate, do you see how that, that grid is helpful in this text? Like, if you don't have this grid, you're going to be all kinds of confused when you get to texts like this. Uh, So then, is eschatology practical? I I think yes. That's what is eschatology. Is eschatology practical? I think yes. One, because eschatology helps keep us gospel-centered. Eschatology helps keep us gospel-centered. Now, You might think that's ironic, right? Because a lot of times the people who are most interested in eschatology are like the least gospel-centered people. (laughs) Is that your experience? Uh, I had a professor in in college. um, He was more of a a covenantal persuasion. And uh, someone asked him in class, the people who, and he was arguing against a dispensational view. And... uh, Someone said, I, I have a man in my church who spends a lot of time with, like, the dispensational charts and, like, getting the dates and the timings, and he, he's trying to figure out when Christ is returning based on all these events in the newspapers. He has, like, all these newspaper clippings and stuff. Uh, what do you think about that? You know what the guy said? He's wasting his life. He's wasting his life. I think, I think that's true. I think he's wasting his life. It's sad. That's a lot of times, people who are super into eschatology tend to be the least gospel-centered people you know. But if we really understand eschatology, we should be incredibly gospel-centered because, first and foremost, the Christ event is eschatological. Consider the incarnation. I mean, the incarnation alone is a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in Isaiah 7, or it's a typological fulfillment, right? 
because the virgin conceiving and bearing a son uh, initially is fulfilled in Isaiah 8 with, if I can say his name right, Melshera Hashbash. Melshera Hashbash, right? The woman, the young woman conceives and bears a son. The Hebrew, it's, it's ambiguous if he's referring to a, a physical virgin or not, biological virgin or not. In Matthew, it's, it's incredibly clear. He, he's using the word for virgin. He's taking a word that's ambiguous in Isaiah and making it incredibly clear in the Greek. Right. Yeah, probably looking beyond Isaiah to a, a future fulfillment. Right. Yeah, but it's fulfillment. I mean, the Christ event begins with fulfillment, fulfilling the, the typological prophecy of Isaiah. But more than that, Yargon Moltmann says this, the eschaton is neither the future time, get this, every word is, is careful, carefully chosen. The eschaton is neither future time nor timeless eternity. It's God's coming and his arrival. The eschaton is neither future time nor timeless eternity. It's God's coming and his arrival. This centers eschatology then in a person, in Christ. What, what is eschatology, or when Christ says the kingdom is in your midst? What he's saying is, God has come in a person. Emmanuel has happened. The eschaton is here, because God is here. So what, what we're not saying in eschatology, then, is that there is this nebulous future outcome. And when we think of inaugurated eschatology, when we think of already not yet, what we're not talking about is events from the future being brought into the present. Yes, it means that, but not because it means that. <laughs> what we're talking about is heaven come to earth. God in your midst. This is incredibly important. Now, now, we can talk about it in terms of the future coming into the present because in our future is when God comes, right? But it's not by nature of the future because the future is somehow special. The future is special only because God comes in our future. But what, what we mean by eschatology, the reason the incarnation is significant is God, because God comes. God comes. And when God comes, his benefits come with him. His eschatological benefits come with him. We'll see more on that. We're not done with that idea. Yeah. I, I know why you're asking that. It's a very good question. So I think the future is important. But the only reason the future is important is because God comes in the future. Right? So standing behind future time is the coming of God. Standing behind future time is this category of heaven and earth joined together. And the future is only significant because the future is when that happens. Right? So I, I, th I don't think we're reducing it, no. What we're trying to do is conceptualize a God who exists outside of time and us who exist in time. I, I think we can say from, from God's perspective... I'm going to be very careful because we're trampling on very important categories when it comes to God's omnipresence, his dwelling in eternity, right? From God's perspective, the eschaton is a timeless presence. It's where God is. It's where heaven is. But in our, from our perspective, that comes at a future day when God comes to us. When, when what exists in the heavenly realm is joined to the earthly realm. And we get all the benefits of that. Does that make sense? So future's important, but fu future's only important because the future is when that happens. I, so Pentecost, I think, is tied to the ascension of Christ. Because Christ sends the Spirit from his throne in heaven. No, I, I don't, I, I wouldn't separate Pentecost from the Ascension. It's separated by 40 days, right? But it's the, th the 40 days are theologically significant. He's waiting until the day when 
Moses went up on the mountain to receive the law, to the celebration of that, and he sends the Spirit to build the church, or as Moses built the temple. Right? And the numbers are the same. Too. So in, in the, when Moses comes down from the mountain, 3,000 people are killed for worshiping the calf, and in Acts 2, 3,000 people are saved with the coming of the Spirit. So he's paralleling those two. Yeah? Yeah. I think Genesis 3, 8 is the first day of the Lord. We'll get to that. God comes in, in eschatological judgment to make things right. And they flee from his presence. Oh, yeah, before Genesis 3. They lived in where we're, where we're aiming towards. Yeah, well, if we think of old creation, or if we think of Eden and New Jerusalem, or from your perspective, right, it's Eden, New Jerusalem. What Eden possessed was heaven on earth. What Eden possessed was the presence of God. What Eden possessed is what we lost and what we'll gain again. So in that sense, they they experience, there was was eschatology in Genesis 1 and 2, and we'll talk about that, because the, the, the garden was supposed to be expanded. But in a very real sense, they had this already. And we're trying to gain it back again. Paradise restored, paradise lost, paradise restored. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Because Adam was told to rule over the earth, to subdue the earth, to show dominion. And we start in a garden and we end in a city. And the point is that dominion has been shown by Christ. I think that's why. Christ has come. Adam Adam was supposed to take the garden, expand it around the world, and build a city. I think that's what his commission was. And Jesus does it. Good question. Okay. Um, so when we think about the incarnation then, this is why Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is near. Why is the kingdom of heaven near? Because God is near. God is there. He's looking at you. And he's saying the kingdom is here. God has come. The eschatological reality has come. Heaven has come to earth. Emmanuel, God with us, has Come. That's what he's saying. Revelation 1 4, grace to you and peace from him who was or who is and who was. And what would you expect? Who will be? Who is, who was, and is to come. Do you see that? So, uh, Yagran Mothman helps us again. We should expect from him who will be. But instead of the future verb, ani, he uses the future of the verb to come. Right? He doesn't say who will be. He said the one who is coming. God's being is in his coming, not his becoming. If if it were in his becoming, then it would also be in his passing away. But as the coming one... God and time are linked in such a way that God's being in the world has to be thought of eschatologically. And the future of time has to be understood theologically. That's what we said before. Now, where you have to be careful with Moltmann, he's very helpful in in many things. He is a panentheist, though. And he comes close to denying... um, No, he comes close to, like, process theology at time. That God is in a process. So you have to be careful with him. But I think he's right in what he's saying here. That the, our future is in the one who is and who was and who is coming. The one who will be in our midst forever. Right? That's the, old, the ultimate expression of eschatology is Revelation 21 Three, I will be with them. I will be their people. Or they will be my people and I will be their God. 